Hi, everyone, and welcome to RIT Sports Zone. I'm John DiTulio. And I'm Shelby Hill. The puck has dropped on another season of RIT men's hockey, and with many players returning from last year, the Tigers are poised to make another run at the Frozen Four. But Shelby, RIT is traditionally a slow starter, and this year is no exception. After opening the season in Nebraska, the Tigers return back home to Rochester for Brick City homecoming, hoping to avoid an 0-3 start against the UMass Lowell River Hawks. A great atmosphere at the Blue Cross Arena as Shane Matalora made his first start of the season for the Tigers in front of a full house. Pick it up in the third, tied at three. With just over five minutes to play, Ben Lynch, the backhander to Tyler Brenner, who scores to give RIT a 4-3 lead. Now, final seconds of the game, Tigers trying to hang on, but Scott Campbell in the right place at the right time, puts it past Matalora with 1.3 seconds remaining. And UMass Lowell stuns the Tigers with the equalizer as this one ends in a 4-4 tie. So the Tigers are now 0-2-1 on the year. Tyler Brenner scoring two goals and added an assist. And Shane Matalora finished with 24 saves. With more on the heartbreaking finish, here's our very own Allison Dupre. A sold out crowd of over 10,000 people packed the Blue Cross Arena for Brick City homecoming weekend. And the Tigers, with UMass Lowell, delivered an instant classic. UMass Lowell tied the game with 1.3 seconds remaining, leading to an overtime that ended in a disappointing tie. This is your first game at home with RIT. How did it feel in front of a sold out crowd at the Blue Cross? Unbelievable. I was uh, definitely speechless like when the crowd was roaring and we came out to that crowd. It's an unbelievable feeling. Just never experienced anything like that before. It's crazy. Here we had our corner crew right on top of us yelling and the fans all behind us and it really gives you chills coming out of the dress room and hear them chanting RIT and it, it really gives you that extra boost of energy to get going out there. How did it feel to score your first goal as a Tiger? When the puck went in the net, or actually when the puck came on my stick, I was just like, oh my God. And I, like, you don't think that, uh, that you have so much time, so I just, I just let it go. And when the crowd went nuts, I pretty much just, I was, it was unbelievable. I just can't even explain that feeling when, uh, when the crowd was into it, I got into it, the boys came in the huddle. It was just an unbelievable feeling. Did you think there were extra nerves on the team going into this game, being a home opener and homecoming weekend? No, maybe at first, first five, ten minutes until that first TV timeout, we kind of kind of sat down, took a step back, and I think everyone was just ready to go. And, and uh, you know, after that, then we started playing very well. A lot of the veterans, I mean, they all played in a bigger stage, being at the Frozen Four in front of 30,000. But, I mean, for us new guys, freshmen, just this experience was crazy. We are all fired up for the game. I thought in the first period, I thought we looked a little nervous and a uh, little tentative. And then the second period, I thought we got our feet underneath us. And then uh, third period, we just had a lapse at the end. And then that's what, uh, I guess, cost us the win and had to settle for a tie. How did you feel about the big performances, the people who really showed up tonight, Brenner and Hartley? Well, you know, I thought uh, from offensively, I thought they did, both did a very good job. Adam, uh, in particular, with his face-offs. But uh, I thought Tyler competed pretty well. Uh, taking guys wide and that. I, I thought we had some good performances by other guys and, and, and they got rewarded with some points. You know, like I said, uh, I would have liked to see a different finish and, and uh, with guys doing a little bit better job defensively for us. So, like I said, I'm, I'm just disappointed with the way obviously it finishes. But you've got to learn from those and that's why we play these non-conference games. It's not always to evaluate players, but it's also to evaluate our, our mindset and our makeup uh, when we get into these situations. How did it feel after that long delay with the glass breaking on the ice? Was it different having to transition? Yeah, that was interesting. Um, you know, it, it did take away from our, the wind in our sails there, but I guess in a way we got a little rest. Got, we got the rest of the legs there. I don't want to use an ex excuse, but you score a goal, you get the lead, and you got some momentum going, and then and, and then there's a long delay. And, uh, so it, you know, it had a some effect, but it's you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the reason for the outcome of the game. There was other different reasons other than the gl the glass breaking. What happened from your perspective on that 4-4 goal? Uh, they chipped it in, they had the goalie pulled and all that, and then we ended up trying to wrap it around the boards to chip it back out, and it just got pinched on the wall and came back down low and then uh, pass out in front, and I 
sort of moved over and then the guy cut across and I just didn't get my pad all the way flat on the ice. We thought the game was over. I mean, we played like the game was over and we were sleeping and, and they scored the goal and they didn't give up until the end. They, you know, uh, they had nothing to lose. Uh, I'm sure in the back of their minds they were wondering if they could do it, but, uh, but we gave up and they, they tied it. So it was a, a tough pill to swallow. What are some of the feelings being so close to victory with the overtime and then ending in a tie? How does that feel? Honestly, to, to all of us, it feels like a loss, Being uh, getting that far in the game, being up 4-3 uh, to three with, I mean, they scored with, I believe, a second left, maybe just over a second. It, uh, it's a shot to the heart. We wanted it real bad. Where are some places you'd like to improve moving forward after tonight? Well, uh, playing for full 60 minutes, we didn't do that tonight at all. You know, last one minute, we got we to gotta keep our heads up, we got to look around and pick up guys there. And, that's something we're going to have to work in practice is just, you know, playing with the lead and learning how to shut their team down. I think really for us it's uh, trying to get our uh, defensemen some experience. That We've got three young ones. Uh, we had two of the freshmen playing uh, today, and I thought they did a good job. And then in, in net, we've got to solidify that position and uh, be just a little bit stronger there, uh, come up with some saves when we really need them. Uh, we've just got to improve our special teams and just our compete level, I guess, a little bit. Uh, it's got to get a bit, a bit better. I mean, it's just something for us to work forward uh look forward to I mean work hard a lot harder in practice maybe and uh, get at it for next weekend and hopefully take home uh, the, the whole weekend and get full points. No, they're going to wave it off. Brick City Homecoming Weekend brought many alums back to campus, including the head coach of UMass Lowell. In his 10th season with the Riverhawks, Blaze McDonald returned to coach against his alma mater. The 1985 grad helped lead the Tigers to two national championships in the 1980s. Our own Allison Dupre caught up with the former Tiger to reminisce about his glory days at RIT. You won a couple of championships while you were playing in RIT. What was that like? It was unheralded, our first national championship in 83. Ironically, we beat uh, UMass Lowell. At Lowell, it was in my hometown, so that was, uh, it was really cool for me to go back to, to my hometown to win a national championship, and quite frankly, it was like Miracle on Ice too. You know, they were far better than we were. They had demolished all Division I teams in, in that year, but uh, Dave Burkholder stood on his head as our goaltender, and we got timely goals, and uh, it, was, it was really uh, uh, a remarkable thing for us, and it, uh, the sense we got in the city, we were honored by the Rochester Americans uh, on campus and everything was, was somewhat overwhelming. Uh, so that was terrific. And then my senior year, we were able to win the national championship as well. Uh, and I was one of the captains on the team. So to be able to finish your career uh, winning your last game, not a lot of people have that opportunity. And it, uh, it just kind of was a good ending for our, for our senior class for sure. Tell us a little bit about the emotions that go into winning a championship, um, being a Cinderella type story back in the day. Well, you know, it's um, it's a unique thing. You have to have that collective unity and belief, and uh, people will try to tell you you can't do things, but you have to rise above that. And uh, you know, to accomplish things that you could, you know, you were almost afraid to dream of. And you'd, we'd go into some of these big games, <clears throat> you know, with a, a level, a good level of anxiety and fear, but then that would turn into fearlessness. Then to actually accomplish your, you know, your dreams, if you will, was uh, was remarkable. To, and to do with the guys, we just never realized. We never got caught up in in it until it actually happened and then to say you're a national champion um, you know there's not a lot of people that have that opportunity and, and that's uh, you know that's something you, you you cherish for the rest of your life. What are some of your favorite memories from playing with those guys in 83 to 85? Well outside of winning you know it's all the team camaraderie things getting to know a lot of people and uh, but I since have developed lifelong relationships and, and have great friends uh, you know from southern Canada from here in Rochester from all over the place so that's the best thing the camaraderie and Chet Hallis and Robbie Rolfs are two guys that I played with that live in the Boston area I see them all the time as well Robbie's uh, son plays with my son. What's it like being back at RIT? It's been 25 years since you won the championship and now you're back. How does that feel? Well, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a long journey, but it's a pretty quick journey, it seems like. But to come back 
with the circumstances of uh, tonight's game, for example, and this weekend is really remarkable. I'm so happy for the program, happy for the community and the university, so I'm glad to be part of it this weekend. What are some of your thoughts on how RIT hockey is doing today in its Division I program? You know, what a Division I program can do for a university is amazing. You know, it's the front porch of most universities, and the imaging and branding that it's able to provide RIT, which already has a great image, is really exceptional. So I'm glad to be part of it this weekend. I thought what RIT did last year was just far bigger than that and uh, you know that's a credit to the every the administrators the people that supported the program obviously the coaches and the players uh, and I'm very proud of that you know I as I mentioned like in the springtime I was in touch with a lot of RIT people I hadn't spoke to in a long long time and they were coming out of the woodwork in terms of uh, you know who's going to Detroit and all that type of thing so um, I just very proud you know they they don't pay my bills but uh, I'm very proud of the program. Is it emotional for you as alumni to go up against RIT tonight? Yeah, I think it will be. Given the, Once again, I think the circumstances dictate that, where it's going to be a big crowd here tonight. That's terrific. When I was a player at RIT, we played a few games here against Clarkson and St. Lawrence and a couple other good teams. So uh, to come back into this building in front of a big house is going to be a lot of fun. Everything that surrounds the game is, is really um, exciting. But once the puck drops, it's uh, just like any other game. Among the record crowd at the RIT UMass Lowell game was ESPN hockey analyst and former NHL player and coach Barry Melrose. Melrose was a guest of the university and was invited to take part in the homecoming festivities. He spent time signing autographs and posing for pictures with fans as well as doing interviews where he told SZ that the Tigers are now on everyone's radar. They're not going to sneak up on anybody anymore. Uh, when RIT comes into your building now, they'll say, hey, this team was at the Frozen Four last year. They've still got a lot of players that played in that uh, series, so we better be ready. So uh, they'll have to play better this year than they did last year because there's no surprises. Everybody respects RIT now. They know they got a great coaching staff. They know they'll be prepared night in, night out. So uh, if anything, it's going to be harder for RIT uh, to get back. The good news is they got to win their tournament. If they win their tournament, they're in the tournament and they have a chance of winning. So that's all our RIT's goal or any small team uh, goal is to get in the tournament. If you get in the tournament, you can win it. Where do you think RIT fits in with those Ivy Leagues and those big northern teams? Well, they, they proved last year they're as good as anybody. They beat a lot of teams that, that on paper were better than them, and, and that's what I like about RIT. Uh, you know, will beat skill, and, and they did that last season, but the good programs do it year after year. It's not once out every five years. It's every year. BC's, you know, the, the BU's, the Wisconsin's, those guys are there every year. And that's a sign of a great organization. So uh, if they can do that at RIT where they're competitive every year, where they're going to the tournament every year, then all of a sudden they become one of the best, uh, best organizations and one of the best programs in the nation. Meanwhile, the black jerseys worn by the Tigers were auctioned off following the game. The Tigers raised nearly $7,000 for former Rochester Amher Craig Sharon, who sadly passed away on October 19th following a courageous battle with cancer. Welcome back to SportsZone. After nine seasons and over 200 victories at RIT, women's volleyball coach Roger Worsley moved west last fall to pursue an opportunity at Stanford University. As Shelby Hill reports, Worsley's departure opened the door for a familiar face to return to the Brick City. Nearly 20 years after leading RIT to three Empire Athletic Association titles and the Division III National Semifinals, Jim Lotus is back with the Tigers and ready to pick up where he left off. And so what brought you back this year? Uh, I think it's a little bit of everything. Now that I've been fortunate to be Division III, II, and I, there are many different things about the three levels that uh, pros and cons. Yeah. One of the things I like typically about Division III is for the most part, these student athletes want to be here. Obviously, they're not getting a scholarship, so it's not about the money. It's not about, uh, hey, uh, I get a chance to be on this great team, North Carolina or something. You know, It's about, I really love the sport and I like to play. And then the other thing, obviously, the great academic tradition, they really are student athletes. 
Lotus returns with a wealth of experience, having spent time at the D1 level with Buffalo and North Carolina. Since he coached Division One, what has he brought that is new and something you can learn from? Uh, he's brought us a faster offense. I don't know if that will mean a lot to anybody else, but uh, definitely a quicker tempo. D3 is mostly like high sets, but with Jim, it's always low sets, quick plays. Everything is quick, quick, quick. We just try and get a kill as fast as we can. And do you think he's improved your team that much? Yeah, actually, I think he's done a lot for the team because he knows a lot about just getting back to the basics and technique, and just getting that out of some girls is definitely up their play a lot. We run a lot faster offense this year as opposed to last year, and he helps us with like our confidence and stuff, and he knows that we can run those plays, and he has us work on them constantly. Even with all the changes, the players and coach can agree that there is still work to do before becoming a Division Three powerhouse. I definitely think our defense needs a little work, um, and just our team needs to click a little more. I would say probably consistency. Our highs are really high. Uh, we played with a good Cortland tonight. We beat a good Stevens team in five. We beat a good Ithaca team in three. And when we're playing well like that, I see we can play with almost anybody. But we also have moments of we just ride the wave of, all right, we're really strong to little, little lax, a little bit. So I think the commitment to working hard every play and then the belief that you can compete every play has to be instilled. And I think it's getting better. But I do think that it's still like not there 100% where it's like, hey, we belong on this floor and we can play with this team right now. And now as a new coach, what are your goals for this season? Uh, obviously, I think uh, number one we, we've talked about as a group is the culture change. How hard are we going to work? What's our attitude at practice? What are we going to bring game days? And then wins and losses will hopefully take care of themselves. So that's been the first thing. And that culture has changed a, a, a ton from first day of preseason till now. We, we work a lot harder at practice. We have a, a better understanding of what I'm trying to get out of them. So I, I appreciate that step in the right direction. Now the good news about our team is I like the heart of, even though we sometimes given that four, five, six point run, we fight back most of the time. This uh, Tonight's game four is probably the first time we didn't bounce right back and still make a, a battle of it, so uh, at least we fight like that. After bouncing around the collegiate ranks through the years, Jim Lotus believes that RIT will be his final stop. Let's go 15 years. I'll say 15. 15 good years here, hopefully maybe even sneak in a national championship or something, and then we'll see. But uh, there's no other plans. Hopefully this is it. women's soccer team has turned some heads this season, not just because of their great start, but because of two sisters that are essentially one in the same, both on and off the field. Sammy Falgiani has their story. Alexa and Jamie Martinez have been making everyone do a double take since arriving on campus this fall. How often do you confuse the girls? Um, early on, when, when they first got here for preseason, I couldn't tell them apart except for by their shoes. Um, now I can tell them apart 90% of the time. The identical twins from New Jersey have not only fooled their coach and teammates, but their opponents mix up who's who as well. On the field, people like do double takes and stuff sometimes, and they ask, like, are you a twin or are you really fast? We don't use it to trick people, but I have had so many people throughout my time playing soccer say, either you're really fast or there's two of you. And I'm like, yep, we're twins. So that happens a lot. People, you know, take double takes, and they think we're, like, just all over the field. Since they were young, Jamie and Alexa have been inseparable, which is why they both ended up here at RIT. Well, I definitely wanted to go to the same college as her. I can't imagine splitting up. I mean, we've been together for 17 years, well, now 18, but um, I can't imagine not going. We, we have the same exact interests. We do everything together. Even if, you know, we still find our own ways here, we ha at least have each other to rely on and everything, so. Especially being so far from home for seven hours, so. Well, we knew we definitely wanted to go to the same school. There was, like, no doubt about that. Um, the big struggle was seeing if we should room together or not, um, which we're not right now, but we're close to each other. Um, but we definitely couldn't have gotten far from each other because, you know, we're, we see each other every day. It just, we, it wouldn't work out. 
So tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day lives and how much you see each other outside of practice. Uh, well, we're in the same major. We're both in graphic design and we're, we're really busy. We have classes all together except for one, yeah. which is the same class but different teachers. So yeah. we see each other all the time. Do you guys definitely notice an advantage on the field being sisters? I mean, we've played together for so long that I guess we know we know each other well, so yeah, it's easy playing with each other in the middle. Yeah, and um, I mean, we know what we're gonna do. With, you know, where our students gonna make a run, where we should pass it to each other. So we kind of have that twin connection going on. But despite the strong connection, there are times when Alexa and Jamie don't see eye to eye. Jamie is older by 18 minutes, which is which is actually long for twins, but um. And she kind of uses that. She's like, respect your elders. Yeah. But, you know, it's we're the same, basically. But she sometimes plays that card. I'm, like, really stern with her. I yell at her when I need to. Well, just to, you know, get her back on her game. If, or she does the same for me. So, I mean, I guess a little bit of bickering back and forth. But that's about it. <laughs> They're goofy. The girls love them. Um, they fit in perfectly. Um, Alexa is the more outgoing, loud, social twin. Jamie's quieter, um, but they're both loved. And they've both made a rather seamless transition to life at RIT. This team made it really comfortable to, to come in here and you know play with everyone. They made it really easy and fun and everyone's really nice here. So Yeah, as far as soccer, um, we got a workout plan over the summer, so the fact that we did everything that we needed to definitely made it easier. I've never seen freshmen who have had such a great ability to play in the middle of the field under pressure, hold the ball, and be so composed. Um, I think they both have tremendous careers in front of them. The RIT men's soccer team is in the sports zone spotlight this week as they celebrated senior day against Alfred University. The Tigers going for their third straight victory at RIT Field. We pick up the action in the first half, 18th minute. Senior Brett Dietz awarded the free kick from 25 yards away and he delivers with the goal to the right corner. It was 1-0 Tigers. They added another to 26 minute as Dom Calabrini scored. RIT hung on for a 2-1 victory on senior day. What's your most notable memory from playing here at RIT? Uh, I think just playing on this field, the battles we've been through here with the team. I mean, it's been a, a real team effort with what we've been through here. So I think it's just the camaraderie we've had with our teammates that's been, been able to get us through some tough ones on this field. Uh, it was probably this year scoring the game tying goal with five minutes left against Nazareth earlier, earlier in the year. And then we uh, eventually went on to win the game in overtime. So yeah, it was a good feeling. Well, that does it for this edition of RIT Sports Zone. Don't forget, for the latest episodes, podcasts, web extras, and more, we're always on at RITSC.com. So until next time, thanks for joining us here in the zone. <laughs>